Hi, so I'll, I'll start the program. Um, first, I have to get rid of an administrative matter, which is if you're interested in getting CLE credit, um, New Mexico apparently has um, incredibly tough watchdogs when it comes to CLE. So what you need to do is you got to sign in, and then when you leave, you got to sign out to make sure that you were here. Um, otherwise, we're honored tonight to um, have Professor David Pierce from Washburn University. Um, he is the Norman R. Poses Chair in Business and Transactional Law, and I should have that memorized because I've said it a few times today. Um, he's also the director of the Washburn Oil and Gas Law Center. Um, he is the author of the Kansas Oil and Gas Handbook, the co-author of the Cases and Materials on Oil and Gas Law that my class uses, co-author of the Hemingway Hornbook on Oil and Gas Law and Taxation, the co-editor of the Kuntz Treatise on Oil and Gas Law, and the co-editor of the Oil and Gas Reporter. He's also the past president of the Rocky Mountain Mineral Law Foundation and a member of the American Law Institute. Um, so we're very lucky to have him here today all the way from Kansas. So Professor Pierce. Thank you, Alex. <laughs> well, I had the, uh, had the pleasure to spend the past hour with uh, um, Alex's oil and gas class, and I'm welcome uh, to this presentation. Uh, I'm, I picked a topic, uh, I spoke to the faculty earlier today uh, with regards to part of the issues that I'm going to be looking at. But I thought for this presentation I would focus on correlative rights. Um, it's, it's kind of one of those, I think, uh, neglected areas of the law that may be coming into its own here uh, pretty quick, at least a, a, a good sort of theory that I think uh, we need to take a peek at. The, if we look at the concept of correlative rights, we're looking at rights in a pool, common source of supply, reservoir. I'm going to use the term reservoir to refer to all of those. And I think your conservation statutes in, in New Mexico basically use that same um, type of definition. The rights, as the term suggests, correlative rights, they are relative, they're not absolute, which means you have certain rights, but you're limited because you are part of this uh, interconnected reservoir uh, environment. Uh, the, uh, if we look at Crowley rights and break it down into to kind of the two fundamental areas, we have private rights and public rights. And that, that private element, um, we're looking at obligations that one owner within the reservoir owes to another or all the others in the reservoir. The public component typically focuses on a limitation on the regulatory agency uh, on how it deals with uh, the various owners. And note here, in all, in all instances, that's typically going to be some sort of limitation on the rule of capture. So we're going to be limiting their freedom to go out and exercise the right of capture and it's going to be a state agency or conservation division that's, that's uh, sort of marshalling those rights between the parties and that public right is that they be dealt with in a fair manner. Uh, when we look back at uh, kind of the historical development of oil and gas law, uh, I, I find it interesting that when the Supreme Court in many of these cases, what's interesting, up until about the 1940s, we had all kinds of cases going to the United States Supreme Court in the oil and gas area, just dealing with basic oil and gas law issues. The uh, Ohio oil case, the 1900 case, uh, concerned uh, the state of Indiana come up with a statute that said, this has some relevance for today, they had a provision that said that if you drill a well, you've got two days in which to uh, find a use for the gas from that well. And if you can't find a use for the gas during that two days, you, you're obligated to shut the well in. And at the time, there were two groups that were producing from this reservoir. Uh, one group were primarily producing the gas so it could be used uh, uh, for residential purposes. They were basically taking it in to a, to a municipal gas supply and selling it. Ohio Oil, as the name suggests, they were an oil company. 
and their mode of operation was they would drill into the reservoir and then they would blow off the gas until it started producing some oil. And so tremendous waste of the gas. And there were two ways that they could have approached that. One, there was a statute, the Indiana statute, that said that you cannot waste the gas. And so there's that public element. And you know, you all know from your study of the basic conservation laws, the main goal is to prevent waste and protect uh, correlative rights. So we prevent waste, and in the process of doing that, we make sure that when we do that, we treat everybody equally. That's the correlative rights component. Well, when it got to the United States Supreme Court, instead of evaluating that from a public uh, regulatory context, instead of saying, you know, clearly this is something that the public has an interest in, the state can regulate in this area, the court instead focused on the private property rights. And it was the correlative rights that they looked at. They, in fact, the court referred to this as a common fund. Nowhere in the opinion do they use the term correlative rights, but that's what they were describing. They refer to it as a common fund, and therefore, to protect the common fund, uh, the regulation was appropriate. Uh, and here, the court basically says it's, it's something that was designed to protect private property. Even though, Ohio oil, you can't produce any oil after two days, which basically means you've got to find a use for the gas on that. And, um, uh, but in 1900, we see correlative rights being the basic uh, sort of foundation for, um, for waste prevention. Later in the 1930s, uh, some of the Supreme Court cases come down and, and then you see the shift. They start shifting and the, the focus goes to the public aspects, the prevention of waste. Everybody was comfortable with that, uh, that sort of regulatory uh, uh, program at the time. Uh, the other thing uh, that's happened is that we've had some uh, comprehensive oil and gas conservation laws that have, that have come into effect. Uh, and, and that in kind of shifted the focus in there uh, to states being able to limit the rule of capture. The, uh, the private priority rights situations, we can put those in, in two categories. One would be that, that public context where we are uh, trying to limit uh, Ohio oil, we're going to limit the ability to produce, but we've got to do it in a fair manner. So that, that's a limitation on the public interest on that. Um, and the other, the more private aspect here was the element of somebody doing damage to the reservoir. So we want to try to regulate that and control you know, what the parties are doing. Uh, and I might mention as we're going through this, if you've got questions, comments, bring it on. Uh, I'd rather have that exchange uh, throughout the program as opposed to me just uh, talking with you. So anyway, the, uh, the conservation aspects, somebody taking more than their share, and then somebody doing damage to the reservoir. At this time, the correlative rights were all, the private correlative rights were all viewed in a negative context you cannot damage the reservoir. You cannot take more than your proportionate share. You cannot do these various things. Uh, the affirmative rights uh, have basically been those things that the agency does. Now, I have a right to be protected from the Oil and Gas Conservation Division doing things that are unfair. So that, uh, up until today, I think that's probably where we're at. And one of my sort of queries has been, why is that the case? I mean, uh, we, we see this strong sort of private property aspect of correlative rights, and, and I couldn't find a case in, in New Mexico where they've addressed truly the private rights aspect. All the cases have dealt with how the uh, Conservation Division treats the parties when they're limiting their ability to exercise rule capture, but never any private rights. And, and, and that's not unusual. I mean, that's pretty much the situation you'll find across the United States. And I wondered why that was. And I think the main concern was that if we uh, recognized a present right to the oil and gas in the reservoir, and this 
correlative right as being some sort of an allocation of your portion of that reservoir, that that was going to impair development. And it was going to impair the rural capture, which basically said, if I've got a well on my property, I can produce all I want, regardless of how it impacts surrounding properties. Um, and they referred to this as the fair share. And it was none other than the board of directors of the American Petroleum Institute that I think caused the problem. Uh, they start out with their 1931 statement of policy. So that, and grant, the American Petroleum Institute is, is sort of the uh, industry representative. So what they say was, you know, that was, that was pretty important. 1931, it endorses and believes the petroleum industry endorses the principle that each owner of the surface is entitled only to his equitable and rateable share of the recoverable oil and gas energy in the common pool in a proportion which the recoverable reserves under their property bears to the total. So they're basically saying, that's what you have. That's only what you have. So if somebody next door, in theory, drills a well, exercises their right of capture, at the point in time when they have removed their proportionate share, presumably, they should stop. Uh, and I guess, plug the well and let the other folks have a chance to go in and get theirs. Uh, that wasn't going to work. And uh, in 1942, I like this, they call it a clarification of the policy instead of, we were just wrong, we're sorry. Uh, but it, it says, you can see now, this is the classic statement that we see today. And you'll see this represented in, in the New Mexico statute and indeed every statute out there. It's probably one of the few areas where um, I think it's in Williams and Myers and also in, in Kramer and Martin's pooling uh, book. They, they talk about it and they say, we want to say that you have the opportunity to develop your property. And then they go, and we want to really say again, and they do, they, they say again, it's just the opportunity, not uh, any sort of guaranteed share of the, uh, of the pool. So within reasonable limits, each operator should have an opportunity equal to that afforded other operators in order to access the oil and gas beneath the property. So this is where I, I kind of use this example. Uh, if I go out and I drill a well on my property today and I start producing 500 barrels of oil a day and the people around me don't get out there and start their production until some later day, uh, I'm probably always going to be ahead of the game. I'm going to get more than those other folks, regardless of how much might be physically located beneath my property at the time I begin. That's just the nature of the rule of capture and this aspect of correlative rights. Uh, the other thing that happened during this time frame is between 1930 and 1942, that's when you had all the states coming on with their oil and gas conservation statutes. And I think because of that, you had a more of a focus on the public regulatory aspects of correlative rights, and the, the sort of private aspect just kind of went dormant. It's, it's always been there. It just hasn't been used and brought to the fore. There hadn't been perhaps a reason. I think it had been, but it just hasn't been uh, uh, focused on that. might note that uh, New Mexico, I, when I was doing a little research in, uh, uh, on your state's law, I, I noticed 1929 they had one of the first statutes that talks about cooperative development. And um, they did that so that, so that operators could join for the development of a reservoir. And uh, they passed the statute though because they were concerned about the antitrust effects of that when the two major producers came together to do that. And, and of course the antitrust statutes come to this to us for the benefit of the uh, John D. Rockefeller Trust and that, that's why the oil industry was always a little bit uh, uh, gun shy about these sorts of combinations unless they had statutory authority. Um, also, we have the, you know, actually, when we look at some of the regulatory developments in New Mexico, uh, the territorial legislature in 1909 passed the first sort of statute dealing with uh, this. And I think the first major statute was 1912. And it's interesting that in 1912, uh, the legislature was addressing what uh, ultimately is 
the critical issue in fracking today, and that is keeping oil and gas separate from water. And uh, the statutes at this time, and, and most producing states about this time, I think Kansas adopted the statute in the 1890s, and it basically said, we want to pass this statute so that we can be sure that the water doesn't get in and mess up the oil and gas. So that's kind of, <laughs> kind of a different, different sort of deal. So it's like, by darn, keep that water out of our oil and gas. And at the same time, uh, they did that through our basic protection that we have for groundwater now, and that is to identify the groundwater, and then you put in casing from the, uh, from the surface down, and then you have cementing protocols to, uh, to isolate the freshwater zones. That was part of this, was the casing requirement, uh, and the other part was the plugging, uh, so that once you're finished with the area, you plug the well so that the water doesn't get down into the uh, oil and gas producing zones. And I thought it was interesting, the plugging was, uh, how was it? You fill the hole with sand and stuff, and then you get a, a, a seasoned wood plug, and you pound it down into the uh, into the zones that you want to seal. So uh, think about that. There's some of we we have about the last estimate probably 10,000 unplugged wells in Kansas in the eastern part of the state. Uh, the first well was drilled there in 18. Uh, the first commercial wells were about the 1880s. And of course, no regulation, no spacing. Uh, and although we had some plugging things, there was really, you know, somebody would drill it and, and go away. And we still don't know uh, where all this stuff is. Every time an operator goes out to operate in the area, uh, they're finding unplugged wells. And that's, that's just one of the problems of uh, uh, the past legacy. Yes? Oh yeah, uh, yes they do. I mean, because you talk about a direct, uh, a direct uh, connection between groundwater and and these lower zones that have salt water, oil, gas, things of that sort. That's there. A lot of these wells back then too. I mean, I don't think the rotary rig system came in until uh, the mid 1900s. Actually, up until then, uh, most a lot of the drilling was done with what are called cable tool rigs. And you just, it operates on the principle that you, you haul this weight up and let it fall down and chip the earth and if you keep doing it long enough you're down to a thousand feet. Uh, but because of that a lot of those holes were never cased and a lot of them were very big sort of, you know, open. Thing. The other major problems that uh, you have uh, everywhere are uh, water wells that have not, you know, you stop and think about uh, hand dug water wells and things of that sort. And, and uh, I know at least in Kansas, a lot because of the oil and gas industry, they spend a lot of time trying to get those things plugged up as well. Um, right now, we've got programs that go out and try to identify these. They plug a lot each year. Uh, the industry's been taxed to, uh, to provide the funding to, uh, to support that, that plugging. Uh, but we're still, we're still getting there. Right now, so. that's, that's a problem. That's a real problem. Yes? Yeah, and they don't uh, in the sense that all of these, since they were historically, we're talking about shallow wells that were, that were drilled. Uh, and a lot of that was the limitations of the cable tool rigs too, but we've got a couple of formations that are called the Bartlesville and Squirrel formations, and you just know that those are riddled. And for most of the horizontal drilling, you're, you're looking at formations that are far below there on that. But we did have coming in some coal bed methane development where they were going in and drawing wells into the coal seams. And that's, that's a much shallower sort of operation. So uh, you would have to be concerned with that. And any operator, if they're going in and they're doing any kind of a water flood or other things that might impact those other wells, mm -hmm. if, if you impact it, you own it. And that means you'll have to go in and plug that well and, uh, and, and deal with it. But the regulatory system is usually when you go out there to drill in any of those areas, the Corporation Commission, which is our regulatory agency, they will go out and walk the site. They will be there when you set your surface casing, when you cement the casing. Uh, 
and and they will visually inspect that process as it, as it unfolds, and then usually inspect the sites as well to see if there are any other wells that might be impacted by what you're doing. So, but it's it's something that uh, they've been working they've been working on for 20 years and probably be working on it for another 20. Yeah. The, the key thing though is making sure that we don't cause those types of problems now for the next 20 years by making sure that you have plugging bonds and the financial responsibility so that if the folks uh, you know run out of money and disappear you've got money that can be used to plug that well and I would say Unfortunately, that, that sort of financial assurance is kind of a mixed bag. It, it works fine as long as the industry's going up and up, but uh, as we know, it will come down someday. And, well, uh, so we, we have some early regulation here. Um, once we get these conservation laws in place, then every reference you see to correlative rights is going to be a limit on the agency in limiting the rule of capture in some fashion. Uh, this is the New Mexico's definition of correlative rights. Uh, you can see it, it parallels somewhat the API's 1942 version. The opportunity afforded so far as it's practicable to do so to the owner of each property in a pool to produce without waste is just an equitable share. Uh, you notice practicability worked in there a couple areas. We'll, we'll talk about that. Um, and then we, we see one of your landmark cases in this area. And the court does, it's kind of interesting because they, I like their summary because they, they really go in and pick out the elements of the statute and, and kind of magnify them a little bit. But noting that correlative rights, not absolute or unconditional, and that, that's going to be important because we're going to look at what some of those conditions might be. The court summarizes those, some of those conditions. It's an opportunity. If you don't exercise the opportunity, you have no complaint. Uh, and we're talking about uh, it's practical. We'll see that in some of these instances the courts were arguing, uh, or the parties were arguing, well, you should have taken more information before you regulated and the court focused on that practicable aspect, the information that was available. Without waste, and, and waste um, waste is not your uh, sort of normal sort of thought on here. Waste oftentimes means that you're doing something that is going to impact the reservoir's performance. So if I go in and I drill a well and I start blowing off the gas, or I start producing close to that oil water contact zone and I'm producing high volumes of water, um, that's going to have a negative impact on the overall operation of that reservoir. And in some instances that may constitute waste. In that Ohio oil case, for example, the waste was they were blowing off the gas waiting for it to turn oil uh, and in the process damaging the reservoir. Um, and again, uh, working in some of the practicalities of, of the operation. Um, Continental Oil Company case, you know, focused on the need to make specific findings uh, before you regulate a reservoir to ensure that you're protecting correlative rights. Uh, the Grace case, I think, is important because it says, well, you don't need to make all the findings if you don't have the information. We're looking at what is practical under the statute in order to protect it. And these things change. As you get more information, you, you modify your orders uh, perhaps to deal with that situation. Well, let's look at the first hundred years of private uh, correlative rights development. And it doesn't, doesn't take much time to do that because there hasn't been too much. But for those of you, I know you all study the, the Yellow case uh, in oil and gas law. And this is where the the Two operators, one was Texon drilling, they were next door to this other property over here, the plaintiffs, the Yellows. They were drilling a well and uh, yeah, it's in Condo Bay. They uh, got lost control of it, it blew out, and it started blowing the oil and gas out of control, thousands of barrels a day, and it ignited and started burning, 
and it went on for, this is what I thought was amazing, I didn't know, I read an account of this, it went on for years. And, uh, and in the process, it, it gradually uh, drained the material out of the reservoir, the reservoir cratered, it was just a big mess. And, uh, but everything that happened came out of that wellbore that was physically bottomed on the Texan drilling tract. And the elves brought suit and they said, well, we need to be compensated. There's no longer any oil and gas under our property. And uh, the defense was rule of capture. It came out of a well bore on our property and therefore we're protected. And uh, the Texas Supreme Court, and this, this by the way is the landmark case, and this is, this is how correlative rights are typically viewed. They said, well, that's fine. Uh, it came through your well bore, but we're not going to give you the protection of the rule of capture when it's been uh, you've captured that oil and gas through negligent operations that have damaged the reservoir. So this is where you start drawing that line. That you'll see me use this term between legitimate and illegitimate capture. Illegitimate capture, Texas Supreme Court tells us, no defense. You're not going to be able to use the rule of capture to protect yourself there. Uh, if it's legitimate capture, okay, you're good, even though we can show that it drained all your surrounding properties as long as you were acting uh, legitimately, no problem. Another case, um, the Ronsky case, this is another one you have in the case book uh, out of Michigan. Uh, this was one where Sun cheated. They had, a, um, uh, they had a, an allowable limitation. They limited production from all the wells in the field to 75 barrels a day. And typically there's two ways that we two major ways that we control production from an oil and gas reservoir to protect the rights of all the parties and to prevent waste. One is to space. So they had these minimum tracks, 20 acre tracks, and then they set up a spacing sort of uh, program on where you put your well. So all these wells were properly spaced over the reservoir, but also they found that if you withdrew that oil too fast, it would cause damage to the reservoir. And although I could have a well that I could open up and maybe produce 800 barrels a day, the, uh, the Conservation Commission there found that in order to maximize production from this field, no well should produce more than 75 barrels a day. So they had this flat limit on production limits from there, and uh, some cheated. They produced more than their 75 barrels a day. Probably somebody was trying to make their unit look better than everybody else, so they overproduced by 150,000 barrels. And the evidence showed that 50,000 barrels came from the plaintiff's track. And the plaintiffs brought suit, and uh, they, in that case, argued uh, essentially conversion in the sense that that was oil that was under our property that was improperly taken on that. But it also talks about, uh, it is a correlative rights sort of deal, because I've got rights in the reservoir, and just like I have rights uh, against the, the state when they regulate to make sure they regulate fairly, I also have private rights against those people that do things in the reservoir that cause me damage. And here they were able to recover for the 50,000 barrels that were overproduced. And I understand talking to some folks that uh, were familiar with this case, that after they got their damages for the 50,000 barrels, the conservation division also required Sun to cut back 150,000. So they basically got double recovery. They got, they got to produce, get caught up on the, uh, the, the 50,000 that was overproduced and got compensated for it as well. Well. That's, that's basically the first hundred years. Uh, the Ronsky case is really, it, it's kind of a correlative rights case, but the one that's a slam dunk is the Elf case. Uh, so then we come into today. And uh, as we look at what is going to go on for the next hundred years, uh, we already see what the future holds there. Uh, we see issues coming up with regards to hydraulic fracturing, which I think will be it's going to be the test case for whether we look at correlative rights uh, and, and apply that as a theory today. Uh, and actually, 
um, in the sense that uh, plurality of rights could actually permit some conduct that would otherwise be prohibited. And that goes back to that affirmative rights issue that, that I mentioned at the beginning. Other areas, enhanced recovery operations, these have been around for a long time. And uh, you've got some cases that we'll look at in, in New Mexico, but the, the big problem has been if I cannot get everybody in the reservoir to agree to participate in the secondary recovery or enhanced recovery, and that usually involves injecting material down into the reservoir, water, uh, and secondary recovery, some other material for the enhanced recovery, and causing that oil hopefully to wash out towards some of my producing wells. Well, what if I can't get the consent of all the surrounding owners to participate, but I still want to secondarily recover from my part of the reservoir. I can go and ask for a permit to convert something to an injection well, and then I start injecting water into that well, and it starts to go across adjacent boundary lines. Uh, is that going to be a trespass? Uh, or is that something that uh, legitimate conduct for me trying to enhance recovery from the reservoir, the fact that you decided not to come along, uh, well, that might be your problem. But, but think about that. Those cases offer an element, and this is the element that I thought about after our, our noon discussion. Those cases also have a component that if the party had made a fair and reasonable offer to the adjacent landowner to participate and the adjacent landowner refused to, then that it would not deny the other common owners in the reservoir the opportunity to pursue their, their interest in that. Development, um, waste disposal. Uh, we'll look at that. You know, if I've got a 10-acre tract with an injection well, and we're injecting into a reservoir, and we know that that's going to radiate out maybe 640 acres, I got some trespass issues there that uh, need to be addressed. And finally, the carbon sequestration area that uh, when we're injecting carbon dioxide into geologic structures. Start out the Act Well and Doctrine. This is really where we, when we start out with oil and gas ownership, this is what it is. We start out with surface boundaries. We draw those artificial lines on the surface, and if you own it, you own everything above it, sort of, we'll see in a moment, and everything below it. Uh, and that would mean that uh, if anybody crosses my boundary line, then there's some liability. The Lincoln Lucky Lee mining case, 1897, New Mexico. Uh, acknowledges the uh, uh, that sort of uh, regime. Um, enhanced recovery operations. You got the Hartman case here in, in New Mexico, um, and this is kind of interesting. I've, there, there are some cases out there that uh, that have been around for a long time, and this is one of them of kind of chasing migrating stuff in the reservoir. Well, this uh, Hartman was drilling a well on his property. He was drilling a oil and gas well and he hits this uncontrolled uh, flood of water that starts coming out through the well bore, and he starts trying to figure out what it is, and he assumes that it is part of a water flood operation that another operator is conducting. And the, the theory is, is that that uh, water has been injected and it's come up through their, um, their well, after a two-week trial, and this is uh, what the court provides us with in the opinion, the jury verdict said that the water escaped from the Yates Formation, traveled through the Tansel Formation, and into the Salido Formation, where it traveled two and a half miles to the Hartman Well. Um, and uh, the jury found liability there, and uh, the key thing here, though, is that they noted that New Mexico does recognize an action for common law trespass in a subsurface setting. Yeah, that's, that's not surprising. The restatement uh, tells us that as well. Yeah. Another case, uh, this is deep well injection, uh, the Snyder case, uh, 1990. Um, they were injecting salt water into the reservoir for disposal, and uh, the claim was is that it was coming onto their adjacent property, and uh, the testimony, the expert testimony, established that there was a fault line. And they had a discussion about how wide a pencil line was, and they had to draw these lines, you draw on the surface. And then the experts tell you that that's a fault line there, none of that stuff went across that fault line. And therefore, 
there's no liability. Well, they also argued in there that we've got a permit from the uh, New Mexico uh, Oil and Gas Conservation Division, and, and that should protect us from any liability in any of them. And the key thing here is the court said, well, it will not immunize the licensee from potential liability, uh, the fact that you get a, a, a permit. Uh, and so we've, we've got that, that piece of the puzzle here in, in New Mexico. And I think that I've kind of exhausted the New Mexico law in that area. But let's look at hydraulic fracture for a moment. Uh, the basic legal problem uh, is that, you know, when you have this uh, well you know, under the rural capture, you've got production that migrates within the reservoir under normal conditions, which you drill a well into it and it starts migrating towards it, no liability. Rural capture protects the party from that. Um, and in this instance, the person that's causing the drainage from their property is going to be able to uh, get title to all that oil and gas. However, as we noted with the Elf case, uh, it does not protect against illegitimate drainage. And then that begins the issue if we have a well that's drilled on our property but it goes across the boundary line into adjacent property, that sort of slant drilling would be viewed as illegitimate capture. I mean, that's kind of the, the easy case. But what if it's a frack fissure? that you created in the process of hydraulically fracturing the well and it's gone across that boundary line. Is that slant drilling? Is it elf situation or is it something else? Um, and we look at hydraulic fracturing, we're, we're looking at pumping sand, water, chemical additives, the slicking it up to send that, that charge through down to the well bore, to the target zone, to crack it up so we can open it up and increase the surface area for the production. Uh, and just a quick sort of picture here, you can't see it too well, but uh, typical vertical well, bracket, uh, you've got the potential, if we kind of assume that these different property lines here, the fracture is going across that, that line. Horizontal well, uh, the only difference between that and vertical well is we get down to the productive formation and then we drive into it for a mile or more to uh, increase the surface area from which we get the production. Uh, you got to do it for shale, shale formations. If you can't fracture them, you can't produce them. And uh, just, uh, I've got my little testimonial here from, from <coughs> Bill, uh, and this is from some Kansas development. And the key thing there was, he was made that statement in 1953. And uh, so we've, had this come around and at the end of class uh, asked me if, if there was any cases dealing with implied covenant to further develop regarding uh, hydraulic fracture. And I think that's that's clearly something that's going to be prevalent because if, if somebody next door fracks their well and their production is increased substantially, if I'm a landowner and I've leased my property, I'm going to get my lessee out there to get out there and do it. That's not unlike the person that sets out here and drills the well, and then it's a year later before somebody else drills. And there happens to be a, a, a 1968 Oklahoma Supreme Court case that says there's an obligation to engage in hydraulic fracturing if that has been the accepted sort of development in the reservoir. So once they found in the 60s that it became accepted in that area, then uh, there was a duty of their lessees to get out there and Frack, 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 right? uh, well, what happens if that crack fissure goes across the boundary lines? Uh, is it a trespass? Uh, and we got two cases that address that issue, the Coastal case and uh, the more recent Stone case. Coastal case, landmark case out of the Texas Supreme Court, and it's been relied upon for the proposition that, uh, that when you frack across boundary lines, uh, you are protected by the rule of capture doesn't quite hold that, but that's what most people would say it means. Uh, we'll see in a moment that that's not quite accurate. But the concept was, five of the justices made it clear that they thought that fracking needed to be promoted here and that uh, they weren't going to let trespass law get in the way. And in the Stone case, the more recent one, takes a look at that uh, coastal 
holy. Coastal, this is the precise holding of it. They basically said since we have a non-possessory interest on it, this person had a possibility of reverter, so they didn't have a present possessory interest on the land. Under Texas law, they could, uh, they could only recover uh, for actual damages to their property. And here, the only actual damages they show, were able to show or allege was drainage. And the court said, rule of capture protects against that drainage and therefore no liability. Uh, the court did not address whether that fissure crossing the boundaries constituted legitimate or illegitimate capture. And I think that's, that's a predicate, that you have to address that before you can apply the rule of capture. I mean, if it was, if it was a slant drilling situation and it was illegitimate, then you're done. You don't have to go to the next step. If it's legitimate, then the rule of capture could protect you from that, from that drainage. Uh, the dissenting justices suggested it would be Ill illegitimate. Uh, the other five justices, uh, for differing reasons, or said it was okay. And we see the, see the judge in stone. We go to West Virginia, and you could just imagine the waving Texas law. Here, we're from Texas. Here, guys, give us this. And the judge says, hey, that's a, that's a blank check to steal from the small landowner. Uh, and uh, looking at the same thing, we're not going to apply the rule of capture in this, in this situation. I set this up because everybody except Teresa Poindexter and me, since 2009, have approached this issue applying an ad solellum doctrine, surface boundaries, protected by the rule of capture. And uh, since this, the coastal case came out, I've taken the position that the court didn't really answer the question because they never evaluated the property interest in an issue to determine if indeed there was a trespass. And um, we'll see where we get to that in a moment. Again, the stone case there, and this is what I think the judges failed to address. They failed to recognize that we're dealing with an interconnected piece of property. It's impossible, as the court recognized in 1900, because of this common fund, as they referred to it, it's impossible for one owner to basically say, this is mine and that's yours, because it's, it's ours in a, at, a, at a certain level. It's, it's all of the parties have a collective interest in that, in that reservoir. Um, and that's where I suggest this reservoir community analysis. Now, it's actually correlative rights. Uh, we're, we're talking about correlative rights. What are the rights of these parties in this particular reservoir that's interconnected? And this activity that's going on, this fracking that's going on, how does that relate to our, our collective rights? Um, note I, I dreamed up this sort of analysis, actually borrowing from Professor Kuntz, referring to this as a reservoir community, and, uh, but also to avoid some of that sort of dormant baggage that has been associated with correlative rights. We're not talking about allocating a share in the, in the reservoir like they did in 1931, but uh, you get to the same place. You know, law professor, you've got to come up with a catchy name for some new theory that you got. That's one of them. I stick them to it. Uh, Teresa, uh, one of my students, uh, uh, as I noted this afternoon, she, she came in, she would not taken oil and gas law, and I, she was looking for a, a comment topic, and I said, here's a great case. And she said, yeah, but I haven't taken oil and gas. And I said, then you're the perfect candidate for it. You've not been, your mind has not been warped, tainted, uh, uh, you've not lost all your sense of, sense of contract law and property law, you'll probably be able to deal with this. And she did deal with it very nicely. And, and uh, I, again, I, I think Teresa would be happy to see the Stone case, to see that maybe uh, they were there. So what's the question that we need to ask here? Uh, as a member of this reservoir community, is this an activity that we want to condone? Uh, is it, or in another way to look at it, 
as a member of the reservoir community, do I have a right to engage in that activity? Uh, so it's you know, sort of reciprocal. If it's, if it's, it's something that's going to do damage or harm to the community, then we view it as a negative right. But if it's something that the community wants to promote, uh, do I get to engage in it? And the example I want to use is the Vicksburg T formation. That was the formation that was issued at issue in Garza. And just to give you a little background on that, at the trial court level, uh, the jury found that there was an intentional trespass, awarded actual damages as well as punitive damages, and uh, then it went to the Court of Appeals. The Court of Appeals affirmed it, and then it got to the Supreme Court, and the Supreme Court uh, reversed applying the sort of analysis on, on damages that we looked at. So, Focusing on the Vicksburg T formation, is this the sort of conduct that we want to uh, encourage? Um, I think the argument can be made that uh, since the Vicksburg T formation is utterly worthless without fracking, then we ought to have some fracking. Uh, now, the, we could inquire as to the actual frack techniques and things that are used, um, but um, the formation is not going to be of any value to any of the owners unless it is fractured because it is a shell formation. And as I note what's at stake, basically this is the future of oil and gas development in the United States. You see those shell formations. None of them are of any value, at least with current technology, unless you can engage in hydraulic fracture. Yes? Yeah, the, the darker part is where we have current plays that are going on now. And then the, uh, the lighter, or the yellow is prospective, and um, these particular areas are what we, we know are shale basins, but they're not, they've not been drilled and developed at this point. Uh, but they're, uh, they're sort of the, the, the areas where shale is a little different from conventional reservoirs because once you find it, it's, it's somewhat like a mining operation in the sense that it, the risk is, is reduced once you figure out how to complete the well and, and develop the formation. Um, and also on a worldwide basis, uh, again, the colored areas are the areas that have known shale formations and, uh, of course, most of all these have not been produced or developed, but uh, they're potential candidates. I noted also today that the, uh, the International Energy Agency uh, <coughs> focused on the U.S. shale and, and the significance that it's going to have worldwide and kind of changing the, the geopolitical landscape. Every estimation of production from the shale formations that we've developed so far have been uh, underestimated. When some of the producers started initially reporting their reserve estimates, the, the Securities Exchange Commission came in and started investigations because they thought they were too high. And they've since dis discovered that all of them were grossly underestimated just because they didn't realize the potential of, uh, of the resource. Uh, so, uh, <coughs> under a reservoir community anal analysis, uh, we would look at this sort of situation where the parties would have concurrent opportunity to make use of the reservoir, even though it may extend beyond their surface boundaries, because it's connected. And so if, I, if I'm engaging in an activity that is viewed as suitable, I think the correlative rights doctrine, and by the way, this is the part that has never been uh, uh, judicially tested. The fact that could it go across a boundary line because of the nature of the sort of connected ownership in the property, that's going to get tested because of the Stone case. And I think that it was probably just a period of time before it was tested under the Coastal case as well. But this is where we start to look at these affirmative rights in the correlative rights world. That has not been done. But it, it provides, I think, a, a theoretical, uh, analytical tool that can be used to, to better define the nature of the ownership of the property interests that we have. 
will still use surface rights to identify your membership in the community and establish your basic rights to the community, but it's not going to be the end of it. We're going to also look at collective rights that you have as a owner, participant in that, in that reservoir. Um, I, by necessity, I think this will have to be a reservoir-specific analysis that we look at. We'll look at uh, what is the um, accepted usages, best practices, proven techniques, um, and, but it will not be it will not be a consensus or vote by the people that are have ownership interest in. I think it's going to be defined by you know, Elif didn't have a vote as to whether or not what they were going to do was bad or not. But it's going to be something that's going to be evaluated. Am I, am I talking about some uh, untested? extraordinary fracturing technique uh, or am I talking about something that has been proven in that reservoir is the best way to develop. Uh, I might mention too oftentimes you'll you know, when you start to look at spacing wells uh, I mean the idea is to try to space your wells ideally so that you don't leave any bands of unproduced oil and gas. Now, a lot of our spacing laws Oftentimes, if you have the setbacks too far, you're leaving bands of unproduced uh, product, uh, oil and gas. And in a tight formation, where you don't have a high porosity and permeability, you need to get into those areas or you're going to end up trying to drill wells in the middle of that uh, to come back and, and uh, produce it at some later date. The uh, trespass is a tort. Uh, I think, though, you got to define the property interest before you can define whether or not a trespass exists. And here we're engaging in a more precise definition of really what they own. They really don't own, you know, it's not the fence line on the surface. That's not what's down below. Down below is this connected body uh, where one party can influence the other. It's more like air above, kind of, in, in that situation. I might mention too that the other thing could be helpful in this area, something I forgot to mention during the noon presentation, and that could be, this is where uh, having um, the need to go get a permit to authorize your particular frack activity in the reservoir could actually protect the producer in the sense that, okay, not only am I engaging in something that is that it's a proven use uh, technique for this reservoir, but I've had a third party prior to me engaging in the activity looking at it and say, yeah, those pressures, those volumes, that reservoir, that looks like the norm. And when you apply for it, the other surrounding people can come in and say, oh, no, it shouldn't be that, it should be this. And then you can have those discussions as what's appropriate. And then the fact that it goes across the boundary line shouldn't matter even though you don't have all those folks collectively unitized or um, in, in one ownership interest. Areas of attention, uh, note to the Cosby case, you know, the air traffic case, basically saying, well, yeah, you don't really own to the heavens. So we know that. Um, and this statement here, that the doctrine has no place in the modern world that was repeated by five justices of the Texas Supreme Court in the Coastal case. And they were suggesting that if we can't figure out a way to do this with real capture, then maybe you shouldn't have that subsurface right down there. Now, I don't know, to me, that's much more intrusive than a correlative right sort of analysis of the property rights, but, but that's, that was repeated. And by the way, the Stone case said, there is a place in the modern world for subsurface ownership because we've been doing it in West Virginia for the past hundred years, uh, 200 years. Uh, but we see the limit here that, they, that they're looking at and the question I pose is will we have similar limits on subsurface? Chance, the Ohio, or Ohio Supreme Court uh, did impose a limit in that regard. It, this was a waste disposal case. They were disposed in waste in an injection well and the plume of the waste was going under adjacent properties and the question was, is that a trespass? And the court here said, no, not unless you can show 
that there is some reasonable foreseeable use of the owner's subsurface and that that has been impaired. And it, it comes down to, they don't state it, but it's almost like who gets there first and puts it to use before the other folks do. And uh, could that be uh, some basis for it? Professor Owen Anderson, uh, he's proposed a theory that when we're dealing with the subsurface, you should not be able to make a claim against other users of even your subsurface unless you can show that there's been substantial uh, damage. And again, typically that would mean either some sort of use that has been impaired because you haven't got there first. And what Owen's looking at ultimately is the geologic carbon sequestration problem. And geologic carbon sequestration, we're taking carbon dioxide at zero pressure off of the stacks, power plants, and so forth. We're taking that, we're pressurizing it, we're liquefying it, and shoving it down into injection wells, uh, into underground reservoirs. Uh, some of that might be used for enhanced oil recovery, but most of it's going to be disposed of in some of these reservoirs. One of the limits or problems associated with that is it takes a lot of underground reservoir to dispose of the carbon dioxide generated by even one power plant. And so you're talking about hundreds of square miles of areas and tens of thousands of owners. And I think this is where you'll see the real tension uh, for, uh, for an attempt to redefine uh, or limit that subsurface ownership. You know, Ohio, they're, they're already there with the Ohio Supreme Court's ruling. Texas, uh, you know, we saw the, the coastal case. Well, Texas has another case pending that deals with the underground injection of waste. And the Texas Supreme Court actually sent that case back to the Court of Appeals, noting that merely issuing a permit to inject does not insulate you from any common law liability that you might have to surrounding landowners, which at least suggests that there's some liability potential that they want the Court of Appeals to address and ultimately come back to Texas. Bottom line, and it seems so simple, um, is looking at the true nature of the property that we're talking about. And when somebody invades that property, is it really an invasion? And if we look at it from a collective sort of combined environment, uh, will we tolerate some crossing of the artificial surface boundary lines without declaring that to be a trespass? Instead, it's part of my affirmative correlative rights in the reservoir. Questions, comments? Yeah. That's all I got. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, Stuart. Uh, thank you for your presentation. It's great. Uh, it's great uh, I have a question about the, <clears throat> the limits of the notion of rule of capture. Whether you mentioned that in tight formations, you might not produce, but for the hydraulic fracturing yep. activity, is it appropriate to courts? you know, draw some limit and, and distinguish the type formation situation where the only, you know, but for the hydraulic fracture, there would not be the migration that seems to be the premise of the notion of the wood capture. Yeah, they could, but I don't think it would be necessary. I mean, and, and the other aspects of, you know, when you talk about setbacks and things of that sort, but the tighter formations, you don't have the degree of, at least in theory, you don't have the degree of migration that you would have. Most of the migration is going to be something that is artificially created. Uh, and uh, so it, it does not play as big a role because you don't need to worry about somebody drilling a well next door and necessarily draining you, at least not on the short term. Uh, and uh, so in that respect, yes, it's a tighter rock. It doesn't have the flow that you would have. You wouldn't have the drainage aspects that you would need to protect against. I mean, where, where I can, for example, where I can see somebody trying to make an argument is your example of, you know, a frack fisher going across the boundary and, you know, the next door neighbor saying, well, that's, that's not, you're not, 
exercising rule of capture lines. Mm -hmm. They're basically, it's more like a rule of going after it. Yeah. That, that now is, is trust, you know, trespassing the river. Yeah, and well, maybe then karate rights takes assumes an even greater sort of role in those situations, uh, and part of it is is you know, is it how necessary is it that you not worry about those boundary lines in order to conduct your operation? Uh, if if I uh, do, I want to propagate the fact the frac so that it goes across. I probably do. That might be a technical issue from reservoir to reservoir. But I probably want to get that as, as developed as I can because otherwise nobody's going to come back and develop it. And I presume the other landowner adjacent to that would be would be taking the same approach. And but the same remedy would be somewhat similar to the rural capture remedy is you do your own well, you do your own frack, and, and you go with that. Now, these small track problems that were involved in these cases, not in not in the coastal case, but in the stone case, I think in those situations. It's, it's more a matter of can somebody say, I don't want to participate in anything and, and I don't want no fracks coming in my property. And of course, if that's going to limit my ability to develop all the property around it, then uh, you know, I, I think that's, that's a, more of a collective sort of determination as opposed to an individual. Okay. Number one, I, I don't know that we're redefining the property interest. I, I still would view it as defining what the property interest is in the first instance, as opposed to redefining it. But, but the policy issue, I think, is something that this is this would make it more difficult to develop certain areas, but it wouldn't prevent development. I, I think, you know, it would make it more difficult. Uh, but as far as that determination of whether or not you should permit recovery of additional fossil fuels is, I think that's, that's removed from, from this sort of property issue. Do you agree you want to hop in? Well, yeah, because I, 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 I'm thinking so that there's, there's, there's climate change as, you know, as the, as the big you know, global environmental issue associated with the development of, of hydrocarbons. Uh, but there's also associated with racking a lot of controversy around more localized environmental impacts like uh, groundwater contamination, water usage, surface impacts like noise and traffic and wildlife disruptions and things like that. Does a, does a reservoir community analysis leave any room for those kinds of considerations 
uh, or, 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 or are they just up with, in your view, in, in regulatory overhead? Yeah. In my analysis of this, I would say we look around at the reservoir of, you know, this reservoir, and we don't really don't care about anything else. We're looking at why do we need to develop this reservoir? As far as the decision of whether any reservoir should be developed, I think that's that's beyond what goes on in this community. Now, that said, I think there's another issue out there, and that is, are there better ways to develop oil and gas reservoirs in general? And you know, if we're talking about field wide unitization, uh, those types of issues, and that's been, I mean, that's been argued since the 1920s that we should not be doing it the rule of capture technique. Instead, we should be uniting those properties, let them develop it as a reservoir, we're going to maximize recovery. But by the time that sort of realization came about, we already had all the private property regimes, and, and it's been very difficult to try to put that, uh, put that unit sort of version back together. Um, but I still think those are two different sorts of, of issues, and I don't know, I forget the second question you had, the other, the other sort of well, it just seems that you're, and, and I actually do think that it is a displacing property of concepts, that, that you're not defining a property in the first instance, although, you know, I, I, I do see where you're saying because it's that before now it's been kind of a useless thing down there, and so now that it's useful, we're really defining it in the first instance. But, but I, I do think that there's still a set of expectations, even though it hasn't been economically useful. So, so, so given that you are, whether you're defining in the first instance or redefining, you're doing it based in part upon public policy. Once you're doing it based upon public policy, then I think you do reach the larger public policy issues attended to both which are, you know, you know, bridge fuels and carbon sequestration and, and more long-term uses of, of, of uh, fossil fuels. So, I, you know, I'm, I'm just, at, at what point do you start thinking about those things, even if you're talking on um, a, a state-by-state reservoir by reservoir level? I think that discussion will probably be a tool when we start talking about carbon sequestration because then you've got a technological sort of tool that can be used to help deal with existing emissions. And that's not going to be feasible under the existing property regime. And, and, and I think that's, uh, that's where Professor Anderson's coming from. So he, he's looking at it more at that level. I, I, my focus on it is more on the, uh, the reservoir level, and that could be the fracking, be the waste disposal, uh, it could also be the, uh, the enhanced recovery. Yeah. On that reservoir basin um, topic, could it also be used to bolster regulation of um, pacing and other things? Because if the reasonable, if the potential reasonable use is that there's this large amount of rock that's protecting the water um, basin above it, um, and use to get to the lower um, reservoir could harm, damage that protective layer. Um, perhaps the water reservoir above it could be also considered as part of the basin? Well, I think all of those are relevant in, for the development. I think they're probably accounted for now. I mean, the minute you drill a hole in there, you've created a problem in the sense that you've got to make sure that anything you shove down that hole or bring up that hole stays in in the well bore. Um, at the reservoir level, my main concern would be is if you did something there that destroyed the reservoir, and that's kind of a selfish view of the you know of, of the owners of that particular part of the property. Um, but I think again we're looking at some of the bigger things, the bigger picture issues that would be decisions that could be made separate and apart from what goes on in the reservoir because those may affect how the reservoir is grown into, they could affect the climate change context, whether the reservoir is ever developed 
but you know, I view those as kind of somewhere other than this sort of private property context in which we're going with that. All right, this is going to be the last question, too, because we have to wrap it up. Um, so, so in defining the difference between legitimate and illegitimate capture, which seems to be sort of critical with respect to the network, um, does it make a difference that the technology, in order to be able to see or predict where fractures are going to be going, has advanced tremendously? So when it comes to defining you know, whether or not I might trespass, I have a much better idea of whether or not I might cross that that uh, imaginary lease line than I used to, especially at the time when the post was dropped yeah. and the experts were talking about and, and that, I think that heightens the issue because it will be easier to prove not only that the frack went across the boundary line, but probably somebody was staring at the computer screen watching it go across the boundary line, or at least have the data in which they would know. And I, then the issue becomes if it is something that you want to propagate it, should propagate it across that property line and fully develop the reservoir. And that's acceptable to the community. Then it becomes even more important to develop that sort of analysis. Uh, otherwise, if we stop at the boundary line just because it's an artificial boundary line as opposed to is that the best way to develop it. And of course, we're not going to stop at the boundary line. We're going to stop probably somewhere away where we can account for the acoustic variations and so forth to get there. Uh, is that necessary when we're dealing with this, this connected body? So what you're in a trespass situ situation, so, yeah, absolutely. So I imagine then, based on what you're saying, is that there's fractures underground that are shaped like this with the boundary line going here, and that might be the most acceptable way to develop the oil and gas because things are crossing boundary lines and they're not wasting. Exactly. Oil and gas, but more than that, I think what you're saying, correct me if I'm wrong, is that it also has a huge environmental benefit to not have to go back in later and re-drill for these uh, this oil and gas because right now they can basically use spiderweb patterns underneath the surface um, as long as they're allowed to, mm -hmm. to get in. And and that goes back to I think the Sturt's observation too that. If we're dealing with a much tighter formation, then you don't have the benefit of the porosity and permeability in a, in a conventional reservoir. So it's, if you get near it, you'll get it. And here, if you don't get in it, you're not going to be able to produce it. Um, thanks. Thank, Very much thank you. Thank you.